is providing us with a great picture and image of the solidarity and the steadfastness and the perseverance and the morale, the wisdom, the courage, the will, and also its capability in confronting the Palestinian resistance. And the surprises, we are also seeing the surprises, surprises which come one after the other in the performance of the Palestinian resistance at this stage. The other aspect is the aspect of the people, the people who support the resistance in Gaza, the popular support, the support in the environment at the atmosphere which supports this resistance and assists this resistance and trusts this resistance and is proud of this resistance and puts up with the hardships side by side and the sacrifices side by side with the resistance. These are the main strong elements, the resistance its action and the people of resistance and the popular support of the resistance. Until now, the possession of the people of Gaza, the fact that the people of Gaza possess these strong elements, these strings, three strong elements, this will impose the position and the stance on the enemy, friend and the whole world. So here we would like to highlight benefiting from this issue which I spoke about before on Marte's day. If the Palestinian resistance in Gaza was a weak resistance or if it had a weak will or if it had weak capabilities or if it had been abandoned by its people and if this resistance, may God forbid, had declared its weakness and its readiness in any form for a ceasefire despite what it was subject to from day one if this had happened, everybody in the world would not just stop on the aggression. They might even then have helped the Americans and the Israelis in fulfilling the aims of the campaigns. And there would have been great pressures pursued or exerted on Gaza and the people of Gaza and the resistance in Gaza to accept the conditions of the enemy. However, the most important element is that Gaza stood and it fought and it showed perseverance and steadfastness and this is still going on now and this is confronting everyone and it's embarrassing and cornering everyone and holds everyone <coughs> to his responsibilities on the other side we have the israelis from the opening hours we started to witness the israelis making achievements we started to hear the israelis speaking about goals we started to hear them raids launch raids we started to hear the political military moral achievements being spoken about. However, the situation is different now for the Israelis. Just a few days have passed. First of all, it's very clear the Israelis have been caught by surprise. They are speaking about the element of surprise and what I said on the first night of the Ashura commemorations has been achieved. The Israelis were mistaken, they made mistakes, and when the Israelis considered that at the first strikes they were able to destruct or destroy the military or the missile launching capability of the resistance, especially the missiles which have a range of 70 kilometers and beyond. Until now, there is still a capability of the resistance to target Tel Aviv and to target some parts of Al-Quds and other areas. And of course, the Israelis were surprised in this perspective. The same thing happened in July 2006. After day one, the Israelis said that from the Gaza Strip, around 40 kilometers, 40 kilometers far away from Gaza Strip, people must go down to the shelters. However, those who live beyond 40 kilometers from the Gaza Strip can live a normal life. Why? Because the Israelis assumed that they destroyed the long-range missiles which reach such a target or have this range 70 kilometers and beyond so they were surprised because now the measures are different now they're speaking about a radius of 70 kilometers Tel Aviv Al-Quds the outskirts of Dimona and Dimona itself and this was not in the Israeli calculations 
And so it's clear that the Israelis were surprised. There might also be other surprises which the resistance in Gaza is preparing for in this confrontation. The Israelis also assumed that after day one, day two, day three, they can bomb and they can shell and hundreds of air raids were launched by the Israeli warplanes until now on targets in the Gaza Strip and the Israelis expected that the resistance would cry out and the people of a resistance would cry out and say that we want a ceasefire with any price whatsoever and the Arab countries, you who speak with Israel, please go ahead with a mediation in order to bring about a ceasefire, whatever be the price. And and so we heard some arrogant uh, comments uh, from the beginning from Israeli officials who said that they would not go ahead with a ceasefire until the Palestinian factions cry out and beg. However, what is happening now? What is happening is the opposite. Now the resistance is taking the initiative and it's surprising and it's taking action and in the uh, discussions which were held in Cairo, the resistance is imposing the conditions. The resistance is the one which is not expecting or not accepting a ceasefire under any price. The resistance is speaking about conditions for a ceasefire. One of the conditions being proposed by the resistance now is to lift the siege on Gaza and they are also speaking about taking away all forms of the siege on Gaza. The resistance is also speaking about guarantees, international and regional guarantees and commitments that the enemy, that the Israeli enemy does not go ahead once again and resort to assassinations and go ahead once again and resort to aggressions. So the Palestinian resistance today is not in a situation whereby it is looking for a ceasefire in any way whatsoever because this might not serve the interest of the resistance. It might not serve the protection of Gaza and the protection of the leaders of resistance and the people of Gaza and these demands are rightful demands for the Palestinian resistance so the Israelis who were expecting the resistance to raise their hands and surrender now the reality is completely different the third point is the Israeli confusion. How should the Israelis behave? What should they do? Should they resort to a ground invasion? Should they not resort to such an invasion? And now we've started to hear some statements from some officials and these statements are backing down. We can sense a backing down. We can sense confusion. Now we're beginning to hear about the fear of the situation backfiring and we've started to hear talk of the repercussions of going too far in a military operation in Gaza. We've started to hear about the financial and economic repercussions for Israel in the case that it decides to go ahead and go very far in such an operation. This is very clear now in the Israeli behavior, even the talk of a ground operation and calling the reserves until now, this seems to be only talk and psychological warfare and pressure. And all of the information which we hear today is that the Israelis called on some countries to mediate with the Palestinian resistance leadership to reach a ceasefire. However, Israel does not want to be committed to any conditions and this is something which the resistance refuses until now. And so, we are up against a confused, concerned Israeli behavior at the very opening days of the operation and I'd like to assure you even in confronting the land operation or the land invasion the resistance in Gaza has the capability and the will and the planning and the plans which were laid out or laid down and the capabilities which have become available after the 2008 war and the holes and the gaps which were exposed and which were filled now. So the resistance in Gaza will be up against a great experience in confrontation and I do believe that the Israelis will be carrying out a stupid act and a big mistake if they decided to go ahead with a ground operation. So today at these moments, no. We have an aggression. At the same time, we have a capable, strong resistance. A resistance which has a horizon, which can bring about a victory, yes. Some people might say it's too early to speak about this, but I say no, it's not too early. What I'm saying is based upon facts and is based upon strength and strong elements. 
Uh, now, let's go and speak about the Arab and Islamic stance. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which was called the Organization of the Islamic Conference, until now we haven't seen anything from them. The Arabs, the Arab countries, of course, some Islamic countries took stances, Iran, Turkey and others, but let me speak about the Arab countries. We heard some stances and until now the stances are of condemnation and denouncing and sympathy. However, nobody had a real stance. The most harsh words I heard is that Israel should be punished. Okay, but how? What is the proposal? What is the idea? What is the punishment you are speaking about? Until now, we haven't heard. So we don't want to speak preemptively. There is now a meeting taking place for the Arab foreign ministers. We heard the foreign minister of Lebanon and he expressed an excellent stance. He called on the Arabs to cut ties and to suspend the agreements and also to put pressure on the international community. So he made a proposal for a series of steps. However, until I came to this speech, until the moment I came to this speech, there were a number of foreign ministers who made, had some speeches, but there was nothing new. Uh, some people just beat themselves. They said that we Arabs, we cannot do anything, and we Arabs must reconsider, and we must do this, etc. However, I don't want to speak preemptively. Let's wait for the declaration which will be issued by the Arab League foreign ministers in order to reveal, in order to discover what the stance is. Of course, summoning the Egyptian ambassador from Tel Aviv is a good step. The uh, visits by Arab officials to Gaza, this is also a good step. It's a good development in the stance. However, until now, we are still doing below the minimum, which is expected. What is required from the Arab Arab countries, as we said on the first night, what is required is a stance, a stance to put pressure on Israel so that Israel stops its aggression and also for Israel to respond to the conditions of the Palestinian, to the Palestinian resistance, the rightful demands of the Palestinian resistance. First and foremost in these demands, a lifting of the siege in all of its forms and stopping all kinds of assassinations and aggressions on the Gaza Strip and assassinations against the leaderships and the people in Gaza. This is what is required today from the Arab countries. However, until now we don't see anything. We haven't heard any statements regarding threats to cut ties or threats to cancel agreements or to suspend bilateral agreements or to use the oil as a weapon, at least as I said before, by increasing the price or decreasing production to put pressure on America. No, Netanyahu or Obama, sorry, in one phone call, he can stop the war. We don't want anyone to trick anyone else. This is the truth. One telephone call from Obama and the war ends. However, just a few hours, what did Obama say just a few hours ago? Obama said that he still supports what Israel is doing and he is covering what Israel is doing. This means that until now, Obama hasn't heard anything from any Arab leader, nothing whatsoever. Nothing from Arabs who are to tell Obama, who are telling Obama, put pressure on Israel or will take steps one, two, three. No Arab leader has contacted Obama and made these threats that they'll take these, uh, these steps. However, we still hope that the Arab countries, especially at this time, we still hope that the Arab countries can take the appropriate stance, the appropriate stance. Now, I'd also like to add that we are afraid, we are fearful that some Arab countries might put pressure on the Palestinian resistance so that the Palestinian resistance abandon its rightful demands to say after that that we played a role in calming down the situation and they can present their credentials hence to the American administration and President Obama or anyone else. What is required today is real genuine support and a true stance. Gaza is capable of bringing about a victory. The only thing Gaza needs is such a support which I spoke of. Let me go back uh, now to what I was saying. One of the most important responsibilities, one of the most important uh, responsibilities for any human being in this life, <coughs> one of the most important themes, the keys, if we could say, 
is a responsibility of working for righteousness and supporting righteousness and the people of righteousness. Hussein, may peace be upon him. Now I will enter into the religious part of my speech. Hussein, may peace be upon him, said, don't you see that nothing rightful is being doing, is being done? Uh, Imam Hussein, may peace be upon him, said that nobody was behaving in a righteous way and that everybody was behaving in a wrong way or in a way which is um, which is harmful to the community or to the society. So when we speak about righteousness, we mean righteousness in all means or in all areas, in all issues, in all subjects, my dear brothers and sisters. There is righteousness and there is also wrongdoing in the ideological issue or religion, ideas, social issues, political matters, economics, military, in the lives of people in the family, in the public behavior, private behavior, in all issues of our spe of uh, our world, there is right and there is wrong. And what is called, what we are required to do is to work to, for what is right, to achieve victory for what is right, and at the same time we must abstain from the wrong, we must not resort to the wrong, and our people must stop. Our people must stop behaving in a right way. We must confront wrongdoing according to our responsibilities. This is the general responsibility which we have. So, if you want to speak about uh, our moral duty or our religious duty, this requires from us, let's go step by step, first of all, to know what is right. Because when we say working for what is right and achieving victory for what is right, this means that we must know what is right, what the meaning of righteousness is, to know what is evil, what the meaning of evil is, and to distinguish between the two and to believe in the righteousness which we have got to know. This is, some, this is a must. The prophets, may peace be upon them, throughout history, the holy books, Everything focused on people getting to know what is right, getting to know righteousness. And getting to know righteousness requires from us to look for righteousness, to take the initiative. We cannot sit down and say, nobody told me. We cannot sit down and say, nobody informed me. We cannot sit down and say, nobody introduced me. I'm speaking about all areas, and I'll give you some examples. I don't have uh, any knowledge. No, no, your responsibility is to look in order to know. Your responsibility is to look, to ask, to know and realize, to discover what is right. Your responsibility is to discuss, go into dialogue, gather all the facts, gather all the facts, gather all the truths. Your responsibility is also to analyze and to reach conclusions in order to reach righteousness and in order to get to know righteousness. And so nobody can say nobody told me, nobody informed me, uh, sitting down on the sidelines without asking questions, without learning. And so education is a must. And the first part or the first step in education is getting to know righteousness and also working to achieve victory for what is right. And at the same time, the calls from Allah were always for us to be the students of righteousness and to really look sincerely for righteousness. Let me give you an example. In any commercial deal, my, uh, what I want is for a commercial deal or a trade deal to be halal, to be something which is cleansed. So I look for someone who allows this commercial deal or this trade deal to, to be as such. So here I'm looking for what I want. I'm looking for my trend, not for what is righteous. We well, you've been looking the sec at the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Said Hassan Nasrullah, as he has addressed uh, many different issues concerning the situation in Gaza, uh, starting off with the uh, Arab League meeting and the statements coming out of the Arab League concerning the Israeli situation and basically saying that there has been harsh words uh, given out from the Arab League 
but we must wait now and see what are the final statements. And uh, talk is one thing, but uh, will it be uh, basically put into action? Because what he had re recommended in a previous meeting and also once again reiterated was that there is a need to actually uh, cut off uh, oil and gas supplies by these uh, uh, Arab governments to Israel and all those uh, countries that support Israel. He says if you want something tangible, then that is the way that it should uh, be done. Yeah, so it's a wait and see, he's taking a wait and see uh, attitude and see what comes out of that Arab League meeting in Cairo. And he also touched on the religious aspect uh, of uh, the uh, situation, of course, this being Muharram, uh, a holy month especially for Shia Muslims and the uh, month that has the martyrdom of uh, the third Imam, Imam Hussein, and he says that he brought us uh, basically to know that we should always confront what is wrong and it is all of our responsibility to be able to decipher right and righteousness from wrong. So that has been a, a little synopsis of some of uh, what uh, said Hassan Nasrullah is saying in, uh, in Beirut and we'll be bringing you more of course on that meeting uh, that is taking place um, by the Secretary General of Hezbollah and specifically dealing with the situation in Gaza. And of course we'll be bringing you all the updates right here Press TV on the ongoing situation in Gaza so make sure you do not turn that dial.